Yeah, hello everyone. It's our pleasure to have like Amira here to uh, share about her work. So today, uh, she will be uh sharing about um like talking about like whether like current uh quantum gradient extraction protocols will um kind of like have like obeys the backpropagation scalings, um and then like how we can use like shadow tomography with like quantum memories and then you allow us to like kind of like deduce some efficient like uh protocols that utilize less quantum resources in the expense of like uh, many like uh classical resources um maybe like Amira can talk, take over the floor and then start your presentation thanks cool thank you so much and yes thanks for inviting me in this forum it's uh I was just saying that the talks look super interesting the ones that have already happened and the ones to come so I'm quite uh honored to be considered and yeah if there's like any um questions at any point just you know feel free to un unmute yourself and, and ask and I hope it's okay that I might also ask you some questions just to see if uh, what I'm saying makes sense because yeah I have to give this this presentation again a couple of times so I want to see like uh if this if it's ever unclear so okay so this work um as you know like this is the title here's the archive link and it started as a, an internship project that I was doing with the with the team at Google and then some people from Caltech um, jumped on board so like in particular like Robbie and I really I think Robbie did a lot of, of work in the paper as well so uh, um, okay good so yes so I'm a postdoc at Amsterdam now and um, let's I don't think there's anything more interesting I could say about myself so yeah okay let's talk about the about the work so um, first things first like I know I don't have to motivate or explain too much here to this crowd, um, but I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page when I talk about quantum machine learning models. So the types of models that we consider in the study take a very specific kind of form, right? There are these parameterized quantum circuits. And um, just for completeness, uh, when I talk about a quantum function or a quantum model, it's usually like I denoted by f of theta, where theta are some parameters, and it's, you know, you can just think of it as like some sort of parameterized operations acting on some input state. Um, and we're interested in, in measuring some observable, right? So this is like our, our typical function. And yeah, I mean, this thing pops up, all I wanna say is that it pops up in, in more than just machine learning or quantum machine learning, right? People are often interested in this type of parameterized function for multiple different reasons. Like um, maybe they wanna simulate some interesting dynamics or um, learn some ground state energy of, of um, some Hamiltonian or something like this, or maybe this, um, parameterized circuit can kind of encode some sort of optimization problem and one is interested in approximating a solution for this and so on. So there's like a lot of, um, I think, use of this type of function in in uh, in quantum computing. And of course, like, yeah, so yeah when 99% of the time when people talk about quantum machine learning, they're really talking about this sort of setup, right? Where um, I think the hope here is that interpreting the output of, of this, um, you know, this expectation value, interpreting this as some sort of label or something like that and trying to understand the expressivity of this function. And um, I think the hope is that maybe we can like do something more interesting here or compute something that's maybe classically hard to do or or something like this. But, you know, I'm not advocating for, for this type of function. All I wanna say is that people care about it, right? So, so if, um, if people care about these types of models and they depend on on parameters, then we're going to need to be able to optimize them. Right? So we're going to need to be able to find the set of parameters to make this function robust for some task and maybe you know specifically some machine learning task. Um, okay, so optimization, you know, typically um, at least classically, what is the most common way to to optimize parameterized functions? And I think this is largely where gradient-based methods come in and um, and why. Let's just say a couple of words on why. So um, classical gradient-based optimization, I think, has been super, super successful in history, right? So if we look at, for example, this, this uh, timeline of, of machine learning or deep learning models and all these really amazing advances that we've been able to accomplish, now I think, you know, we're, we're at the stage of these large language models with, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even have trillions of parameters in them. And um, this was really largely due to the fact that we can optimize these large large language models or large models, right? The, I mean, they have so many parameters and the fact that we can optimize them using sophisticated gradient-based methods is really the key. And 
the algorithm responsible for this optimization is called backpropagation, right? So I think most people already know what backpropagation is, but what I want to highlight in this slide is that like we knew about perceptron models, neural networks for a while, but it was really up until we could like physically optimize these models and train them that all the success follow for um, for deep learning and, and neural networks and so on. So yeah, so backpropagation, I mean, it's it's pretty simple, right? It's a, it's a recipe to compute gradients um, of some parameterized function. And I think what I want to say is that it's also um, computationally efficient to do so, right? So this is the key. And a couple more things is that, you know, a lot of people say that it's just, um, it's just a chain rule, but I think it's a little bit more sophisticated than that in that um, information is computed in a function in a very clever way, such that it's like sort of, re it's stored and reused to compute gradients. And this is where this efficiency comes from. So it's not just the chain rule, it's also like information in, uh, reuse in, in, a, in a model. So this is, I think, quite, quite a nice uh, property of backpropagation. Okay, so what's the problem with um, with quantum gradients and specifically the model that I, I just presented to you? Um, okay, so let's talk with a little, very simple toy example of one qubit, the nuance of, of quantum gradients. So imagine I've just got like one qubit that I start off with in the zero state and I just do one parameterized operation, right? So maybe it's like some sort of rotation that's parameterized by uh, a scalar value theta. And then I call this like my parameterized state. Um, so if I had to draw the circuit, then you know it kind of looks like this this rotation about some axis, and this depends on some some value for theta. Um, so I can explicitly write out the gradient with respect to this state, right? I mean, pretty pretty trivial. We can like uh, drop down this minus i x term here and uh, write express the gradient like so. And then if I, let's say, want to measure some particular observable, like some, let's say the, the observable interest is, is the Z operator, then I can write out my function in terms of this, um, you know, like this parameterized uh, model I spoke about in the beginning. And we just have one parameter in the, in the model and this is our observable of interest. So if I can write out this expression, I can now write out the gradient, right? And I can use the product rule to just very nicely and easily write out the gradient. And I can simplify this task of estimating the gradient of my function with respect to my parameter by setting the theta to zero and then just looking at and evaluating this quantity here. And the illustration here is just that, you know, uh, in, in this simplified setting, um, estimating the gradient of our function reduces to estimating a, an expectation value of these uh, two things here, z and x, right? And um, importantly, these two things don't necessarily commute, okay? So this is for one parameter. Um, okay, so if we have multiple parameters in the circuit now, so like, let's say instead of just doing a, a single rotation about the x-axis, maybe we do another one about the, about the y-axis and we have two parameters in there, then, you know, I, I'll save us the time and pain of like writing out each, um, each derivative, but we can express each gradient with respect to each parameter in a similar way, right? It kind of all reduces in the simplified setting if we set everything to zero, our parameters to zero, we end up with the same task of estimating expectation values for each um, each gradient component. And so like if we had, let's say, m parameters in our model, then we'd have to estimate, in this naive way, we'd have to estimate m expectation values, right? So. Um, and these are with respect to operators that don't necessarily commute. So this gives a little bit of intuition as to why, like, um, you know, things are a little bit more nuanced here because when we're dealing with with quantum states and um, things like that, we kind of have to sample. Okay, so let's talk about this efficiency of of backpropagation, right? And and specifically classically, and I think this is my favorite thing to to highlight. So, um, so if we're given some parameterized function. Um, so here I'm, I'm cha I'll change notation for derivatives a little bit, but like let's say we're given some some parameterized function, and now theta you can think of it as an an m-dimensional vector, right? So it's a it's a model. There are m parameters theta. Um, okay, and so we want to estimate this full gradient vector. So now this f dash theta will be like a gradient vector with m entries in it, right? So it'll it'll have every gradient component. We want to kind of estimate this gradient component with some precision. 
And what backpropagation scaling gives us, at least in the, in the case of neural networks, is this really nice uh, relative relationship between time to compute the gradient and time to just run the function, and as well as memory. So what's happening here, what's, what's being said here is that the time to compute the full gradient vector um, is roughly proportional to the time to just run the function. So the C1 and C2 here are just, are just constant. So there's like this relative constant overhead in time to compute the full gradient vector and the time to just run the function once, right? So this is, this is quite remarkable, I think, because you know, this gradient vector can be super large, right? I mean, we can have billions and trillions of parameters and naively, if we wanted to compute gradients with respect to every single parameter, this could cost us a lot. So backpropagation reuses information such that these costs are roughly proportional. So it's roughly equal to just like run the function once those resources are roughly equal to compute gradients. And this is true for memory as well. Um, and in particular for neural networks, these constants are quite small, right? It's a factor of like two, two or three. So this is really, this is really quite good. Um, okay, so that's important. And uh, now of course the natural question here is like, well, can we do this for quantum models, especially those quantum models that I, I just showed you that are super popular? Um, and maybe even relaxing a little bit the constraint that C1 and C2 have to be small constants, maybe we can allow them to depend, have some vague dependence on the number of parameters, maybe some like logarithmic dependence in, in the number of parameters M or polylog whatever. So even this, like if we allow some vague dependence here with the C1, C2, can we still like get something close to this nice scaling of resources to compute gradients. Okay. Um, ah, yes. And probably it's important to already highlight at this point that um, no methods in the literature achieve this scaling for quantum models, right? So there is no, um, this is not, uh, it's not easy, I think. And um, it's often kind of ignored this, this problem. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this cost model because I didn't really talk too much about what time means. Memory maybe is kind of straightforward. Maybe we can think about it as as like qubits and like maybe some modest classical um, classical storage. But um, but time, how do we account for time? So we use a we use the following cost model. We say that access to each parameterized operation in um, in my circuit and, and its inverse. Is, uh, is unit cost, right? So let's say I have, like I said, like M parameters in the, in the circuit in the model. If I apply like M parameterized UJ operations here, what I'm saying is that each of these UJs will cost me one and their inverse will cost me one in my cost model. Okay, so this is unit cost for each UJ. So if I'm applying M of these UJs to some initial state, let's just say, I don't know, the zero state, um, and this is my parameterized state, how much would this cost me to set up in this cost model? And, um, and I'm actually asking you, right? Because I just want to check that this, this is making sense what I'm saying. So if I'm applying um, M parameterized operations and each operation costs me one, how much, if I had to create this state, how much would this cost me in this cost model? I know I'm being like a like a teacher here, like asking <laughs> asking questions, but yeah, I mean, if someone can just take a guess, that would be great. N times maybe. Yes. Okay. Well done. Great. Good answer. <laughs> that is that is correct. <laughs> it's like like super straightforward, right? Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So so this will cost me M, and then if I had to um figure out how much like it would cost to set up my function now, so let's say I'm measuring some observable. Um, remember I said like applying these operations and their inverse cost me one. So this will also cost me like roughly M to set up my function, right? So this is how much it would cost me to estimate this thing. But usually we, we sample, right? To get some, some precision here of this, uh, of this expectation value. So like, yeah, I just put epsilon squared there just for completeness, but the precision doesn't really matter too much. What's, what's important here is this like linear scaling in M. Um, okay, cool. So this is my function. Now, what about derivatives? Um, okay, so if I write out the, the gradient of my function with respect to the kth parameter, so one particular parameter, um, then you can kind of just believe me that, that it reduces to two times the real part of something that looks very similar to the function, except there's a partial derivative here with respect to the kth parameter, right? So, 
So how much would this cost me to, um, to estimate? And if we look at it properly and you know, like kind of count how many operations are going on here, we still have n parameterized operations and, uh, and their adjoints. So this will also cost me the same, like n over epsilon squared for some sampling precision. Um, okay, good. But the key point here is that this is just for a single gradient component, right? This is just for theta k. So if we had to now go and estimate for every single parameter, we'd get a cost that sort of scales roughly like quadratically in the number of parameters, so m squared for the full gradient. Um, okay, so you might think like, well, this is not so bad, right? I mean, this is just quadratic and this quadratic to linear like doesn't really matter so much because I mean, it's still, you know, com uh, computer science perspective, it's so efficient. Um, and so like the scaling we get here is the time to compute the gradients, like m squared, which is m times the time to compute the function, right? So so there, remember, we want like something constant here or polylogarithmic in m, not linear. So it actually does matter that we have this like quadratic scaling, because if you remember classically, these things are roughly, uh, you know, the time's roughly proportional. We don't have this factor of m here. And this makes a big difference. So like if we look at um, at this graph that has time on the on the x axis and for a particular like amount of time you have what this graph is saying is how many parameters you can train in your model if you have like an, an idea of like ideal quantum backpropagation is the green cross and red cross is um is a parameter shift rule which is i think what people mostly use in practice on these on these um misc circuits to train their models and the parameter shift rule has this like bad scaling, this m squared scaling that I talk about, this quadratic scaling. So for example, if I had a day to train my model and I could only do it with this quadratic scaling, I can only have a model with 9,000 parameters. I mean, this is just crazy, right? There's no way we're gonna be able to benchmark. Um, even when we have bigger, better quantum computers, there's no way we're gonna be able to optimize them using gradient descent and compare in a competitive way to neural networks if we, if we don't get rid of this like quadratic scaling. Okay, so there are a couple of things that we just highlight in the paper, which I think, you know, in hindsight is actually pretty obvious. So we'd kind of just collect um, a bunch of results and paraphrase them in this gradient language. And so there's already a, a couple of interesting things you can say if you are in different settings. So let's let's talk about those settings. So, so the first one is um, you can imagine that the input state that you start off with is known to you, right? So this is like sort of what I've been talking about in most of the examples, like we have some parameterized operations that we apply to some known input state. And I've been assuming this input state is the zero state, right? Um, so yeah, so in short, you know how to construct this, this thing. But of course this can, the setting can change to something more general, right? Where maybe you're just given some sort of um, input state psi and you, you don't actually know uh, anything about this state. Maybe there's some guarantees on how it's generated or something, but you know this can be quite general. You could just be given some arbitrary states and then you apply parameterized operations to them. Um, and the state maybe you know doesn't even necessarily have to be pure. Um, okay, so these are like two different settings. And then on top of these settings, you can make some assumptions um, about the type of access that you have to these states, right? So maybe you can assume only single copy access at a time, meaning you can only measure like um, one copy of your of your state at a time. Um, but of course, more generally, you can also make this assumption of quantum memory that people make, right? Where you have like an ability to measure over it as a product of, of some number of copies of, of your state. Okay, so within these settings, there's already a couple of interesting things that we can say. So first let's start with this, um, I think very general setting that is practically relevant. And what I mean is like, you know, usually it would be nice to say something about that propagation in the case where we don't want to make any assumptions on the input state that's given to us. And we want to be able to, you know, implement this kind of thing in a lab, which I think at the moment measuring single copies is probably the most realistic setting we have um, to, to implement this like sort of, if we can do back propagation. So we want to be able to like have a general statement about psi and we want to be able to like ideally measure single copies and be able to do back propagation. Um, but unfortunately, this is not possible in, in the general case, right? So everything I talk about here is like trying to make that propagation work in the most general setting. So unfortunately, in, a, in the setting here, like um, where we don't make any assumptions about psi and we can only do single copy access, there is um, a lower bound that comes from, uh, 
yes, this paper over here, that basically tells us if we take, for example, um, if we assume these like parameterized operations are, are um, Pauli op operations, um, we can kind of uh, we can kind of extra extrapolate this like sample complexity here to tell us that the cost for our um, our gradient estimations in in using this uh, is already like something like m squared. So this already tells us okay, in the most general case where we you know where we assume some some general assumptions about the form of this of these u thetas, um, yeah, we 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 won't be able to to do this um, if this input state is just like unknown. Okay, so this is gonna work. Um, then the next thing that we kind of show or, or iterate over is, okay, what, what if we make some assumptions about our, our input state, right? Like maybe we know it, maybe we know how to construct it. Maybe it's um, guaranteed to be of a, um, of a certain form. And yeah, I think we kind of just show that um, iteratively that this will also still be computationally hard in some sense to be able to get that propagation scaling in this scenario as well. So we can like discuss the details of this, but like um, we kind of show that existing gradient methods uh, fail and um, we use some other results from other papers to show like, um, again, what the sample complexity looks like and then what our cost looks like. And we can never just get this down to linear scaling or even quasi-linear. Um, okay, so, uh, Ah, yes, and something I think is cool that's kind of mentioned in the appendix of the paper, which might be relevant for um, for this crowd. And, you know, if there's interest, we can maybe talk a little bit more about it. But um, interestingly, like, even if you assume your state um, comes from, like, a circuit of polynomial complexity. So, like, what do I mean? Um, you have some finite fixed gate set, and the number of gates to create your states scales polynomially in the system size n, right? So you apply polynomially many operations to create your your state, um, so psi is generated from a polynomial complexity circuit, then you can show that you can like actually, um, uh, maybe learn is not the right word, but you can actually like measure efficiently, like enough, you can you, you can do like logarithmic number of measurements to, ex to be able to explicitly learn psi. So you can like learn psi information theoretically using classical shadows, which I think is quite cool, but, um, Unfortunately, you, you can't do it computationally efficiently, efficiently. So you'd have to do some post-processing after these measurements that will then be computationally uh, inefficient to do. So like this was like a positive negative kind of thing because if we could have um, done this efficiently, information theoretically and computationally, then we would have solved our, our back propagation problem here. So this is a bit unfortunate. Um, okay, but it doesn't really matter for the story. What matters for the story is that this also doesn't work, right? So Basically, both of these scenarios don't don't necessarily work very well when we have single copy access. So, okay, of course, the next natural extensional question is like, well, what happens when we get even more general and we allow for, um, quantum memory, right? If we allow multi-copy. Um, but maybe just pausing there, like, you know, why is it not so straightforward? Um, especially when there's so much overlap in our function and the form of the gradients, right? There are so many repeated operations in here that you would naively expect a lot of, um, you know, the ability to be able to reuse information to compute gradients in a more efficient manner, right? So this is like, this is quite disappointing that we we don't do so well in the single copy setting. And I think the reason is quite um, quite straightforward is that when we measure, we destroy information, right? So it's really hard to, to reuse information in a circuit um, because we destroy it. So the intuition of um, doing better with, um, with multi-copies is that now we can start to design measurements um, that don't destroy our information completely. And if they don't destroy our information completely, then naturally we can reuse it again to compute gr more gradient components, right? So this is this is the idea of why we would expect to do better. Yeah. And um, and yeah, drawing largely from a bunch of other you know successful papers that show that with multi-copy measurements, you know, even this ability to just do measurements over two copies allows us to like already show some separations in learning tasks that um, classical learners and quantum learners, you know, like there's a separation there. So quantum learners can do a little bit more sophisticated things with access to multi-copy measurements. So drawing on this kind of success, 
um, in the simplified setting where you know we assume our parameterized operations are poly operators, we can already show using like some um, some routines in in this paper that we can get actually this backpropagation scaling something logarithmic in n here. So we can we can do this for this restricted setting where we assume we just have polys. But like, what about if we move away from this? And um, if we move away from this and we you know make some statements about more general um, more general operators that we want to want to measure in our circuit, then things get hard again. <laughs> and you know like you you kind of have to then question well like is there something uh, deeper going on here that makes this gradient task so difficult to get down to linear scaling? And um, and then I think yes the answer is yes right and so what we show is that there is a deep there is a connection between this task of estimating m gradient components and the task of shadow tomography which I think is the last thing I will I will say so so what we show and um, yeah I'm sure most people already know this this problem of shadow tomography but I'll state it in very simple terms here just for for completeness and if you're interested you know it comes from this this work of Scott Aronson. Um, the shadow tomography paper is like, imagine you've got a bunch of two outcome measurements and you've got a number of copies of some state psi, right? So you've got some copies and you, you've got some two outcome measurements that you're interested in, in, in measuring, right? So, so I call these measurements here E1 to EM, so there are M of them. And the task is then to estimate, you know, um, so, well, I guess output some estimates, which I call B1 to BM such that these estimates are kind of close to these expectation values that you're interested in, right? So, so these are these EKs. And you wanna estimate all of these things with as few copies of your input state as possible. So you wanna kind of minimize the number of copies and you wanna be able to extract all of these, um, these expectation values with some, some precision. So this is the task of, of shadow tomography. And what we show in the paper is that, you know, Basically, if one had uh, an ability to estimate gradient components, then um, you can also kind of solve the shadow tomography problem with respect to a certain class of observables. We call these poly time observables, which are they're quite general. Um, okay, so there's like a there's a, re a reduction here, which is quite straightforward, and I won't go through it. But basically, what we do is we define a quantum neural network model that looks very similar to what I've been showing you earlier. It's just we assume that we measure like um, uh, Z on the first qubit and these U thetas are like parameterized um, circuits, right? So if we can reduce um, the gradients problem to shadow tomography, like or whatever, there's like the re relationship, then obviously we can kind of port in existing shadow tomography protocols and results to try and come up with a more efficient way to do back propagation, right? So um, it's very well known, like certain, well, the best scaling so far um, of, of shadow tomography. So we kind of take these results and use them to come up with a, with a backpropagation algorithm. So we then are able to show that uh, we can estimate all the gradients. Um, you know, if we have M gradients, we can kind of estimate them with some precision using um, a certain number of copies, which comes, uh, I don't have the reference here, I think it comes later, but it comes from a, a paper from Ryan O'Donnell and, and some other people. And um, and basically using this number, the sample complexity to solve shadow tomography and hence the gradients, um, we can kind of get down to a cost that is quasi-linear in M, capital M. And this is in line with our backpropagation uh, scaling, right? So, so this is the first, I think, proposal for backpropagation that is close to linear in the number of parameters times the, you know, the time it takes to compute the function. So I think this is the, the best proposal for, for gradients so far with a massive caveat. Um, the caveat is to make this thing work. Uh, at the moment, these shadow tomography protocols require a lot of classical memory, require, um, require like uh, memory that scales exponentially in the system size N, right? So this is, this is still really unfortunate and quite inefficient because um, Obviously, we're going to want to do better than this. We're not going to want classical uh, exponential storage, right? So this is a this is a problem. And where does this come from? Um, and in general, sorry, I should also say that this is not something that's easy to get rid of. In general, one cannot get rid of this actually. Um, otherwise, I think we violate some like fundamental assumptions in I don't know, um, yeah, I don't know, complexity theory or something like this. 
So um, where does this thing come from? Well, the this is a snapshot of our like, we call it quantum efficient back propagation, but we still require exponential uh, classical memory, right? So it's not actually totally efficient, um, but it comes from this like online learning um, part of the shadow tomography protocol. So how this, um, this whole algorithm works is, okay, we've got multiple copies in memory. So now here, like I just call these states row, but I was calling them Sia earlier, it doesn't really matter, but we've got some states. We apply our parameterized operations and then we kind of do this, this um, threshold check. And what a threshold check is, is basically because I have copies of my state in memory, I can kind of um, check using, uh, maybe I should also say, so the sigma here is an online learner that is held in classical um, storage. So it is like a hypothesis or a guess for what our true state row is, okay? So we've got a guess for our state um, in classical memory. And we use this guess to basically kind of check whether we're like close um, to the expected value we're interested in measuring. So like, for example, the first threshold check we do is to estimate the function. And um, if this is okay, if the, the estimate is like kind of close to the true value, then we don't disturb anything. We can proceed with the algorithm. And then we can apply like some rotations and then do the threshold check again using our you know, hypothesis state. And we can like then do this enough times to hopefully estimate all the gradient components. So the reason we succeed is because we have copies in memory and we can kind of like bound how many times we would um, violate the threshold check. And then we'd have to like use more copies, like fresh copies to then proceed with the algorithm. So we can bound how many times we make mistakes and we can kind of show that um, with high probability, we'll be able to estimate all gradient components with a sample complexity that that scales like like this little m, which gives us a, a cost that's that's decent in the number of parameters. But but yeah, we need this online learner, which incurs classical exponential storage. Um, and the reason we need it is because we kind of need this guess that we refine for our state offline to be able to perform these threshold checks in a gentle manner. So um, so yeah, so this is like you know, positive and negative negative news, but ton of open questions, right? So like um, the most obvious one is like, okay, well, is there an efficient um, classical computational scheme for like these poly time observables that I spoke about earlier? Uh, maybe there are also like special cases of parameterized models. You know, everything I spoke about um, has been very general, general case trying to make things work, but maybe there are like a special class of models that are able to scale and train well. Um, Maybe it's just time in quantum machine learning that we consider other types of models, or perhaps there is a different optimization method for these outside of gradient-based methods. Although personally, you know, we looked at um, at things like gradient-free optimizers like SPSA, and I think there even the dimension of the parameters comes in, so you can't really escape this with gradient-free optimizers. Um, yes, okay, good. And otherwise, I think that's all I want to say. And yeah, there hasn't been uh, many questions, but if there are, please just let me know. And I also uh, would appreciate some like feedback on the presentation. Yeah, if it made sense or <laughs> there's things I should change or add, just let me know. Yeah, thanks, Amira, for the nice presentation. It did like it makes sense to me. Uh, at least I'd be able to follow your flow and then like all the setups and how and why should we care about the back propagation scaling. I think like all of this has been like presented quite well. Um, yeah, so for the audience, if you have any question, then I guess you can unmute yourself. Uh, maybe I could start off by asking a question. Can you go like back to the kind of like, uh, yeah, this slide. So why couldn't use, why, why, why can't we use like the quantum computer for the online learning like Sigma? Could we use that? Why, why is the reason why we couldn't use yeah. Yes, I think because we have to perform some sort of like post-selection which um, I don't think we can do like in a resource efficient way if this was uh, a quantum state, right? Um, so I think there we, we need to be able to update this matrix on the fly and um, yeah, and, and come up with an explicit construction so that we can, we can use this to perform this threshold check um, offline. So I think this is the reason. 
but maybe if, I don't know. Maybe there is a way to store it on a quantum computer with a fault-tolerant quantum computer and sophisticated, uh, updated in a sophisticated way. Yeah, I actually don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I I, 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 yeah, what I'm thinking sorry? here is like, yeah, what I'm thinking here is that okay, even if we couldn't use like quantum computer, could we use, for example, some linear combination of states, um, instead of proper quantum states, and then we just like uh combine all the kind of like simple to generate quantum states and then make combine them and make them to be a much more complicated one and yeah it might be useful yeah, that I don't super know. Cool. Yeah, yeah yeah no that sounds uh sounds cool yeah I don't know I don't know enough to say uh mm -hmm. why it can or can't work but I mean it sounds so it sounds reasonable it sounds cool right um so we do have one question now from like Abdullah uh so Changes. Could you elaborate on the specific quantum phenomena that hinder back propagation scaling and why it is challenging to replicate the efficiency of classical back propagation in quantum circuits? Yeah, sure. I think um I think this this largely lies with um with the measurement problem, right? The fact that when we measure, um, we destroy our information, right? Whereas on a neural network, you know, there's a lot of redundancy within the function. And so like, as you, you can kind of track the values of the function as you compute it, right? So as you like, you think of a neural network, as you go to each layer in the network, you can kind of keep track of the values of things. You can, you can hold these in classical memory. Whereas in, um, in the quantum setting, even though we, there's a lot of redundancy you know, in the function, we can't keep track of the values because as soon as we try to store them or measure them, I mean, we, we destroy everything. We lose our, our um, quantum information. Quantum information is very fickle. So this is like the, the natural inhibitor, right? I think this is the problem is really that, um, that we destroy information. And, um, and yeah, I guess uh, trying to get around this problem is exactly what, what uh, the reason for having multiple copies in memory is for, right? Now, when when we have multiple copies, this is strictly more powerful than just a single copy. And now the idea is like, can we design measurements that are kind of not destructive, but also get some information out to compute gradients so that we we reuse, again, these these states in memory. So we reuse information much like a neural network can, can do. So this, I think, is the is the idea. Um. Yes. I'm, okay, so I'm not that familiar with this type of measurement setup, but then would non uh demolitions like uh, measurement would help in this scenario? Like we design some protocol that's based on this uh measurement protocol and that extract um the gradients without disturbing the states, for example. Sorry, what kind of measurements? I missed the first part of. Uh, the no, no, non demolition measurements. Non demolishing measurements. You mean like gentle measurements? Um okay, I'm not too sure if these two are the same thing because um I remember for non-demolition measurements you are cup on um, basically each time you measure it, you wouldn't like disturb it too much. Uh and then it's right. not like doing for multiple copies, so I'm not too sure if these two are the same thing, but yeah. So at least so like mean... uh, mm -hmm, sorry. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so you mean like by not disturbing too much, you mean like you can kind of um say how close you are to the state in some distance, like trace norm after you measure it? Mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah, this one I will go check out because like um I just this like this kind of measurement protocol suddenly pop out on my mind after you say like because of the um like the, the destructive effects of measurements. I remember there's one type of measurement that's like that don't really have this uh issue, but then of course there will be some kind of like constraint for those kind of measurement that we uh I, like we have to go and check out. Yeah. Yes, um, I think they're the same. I think they're the same as these gentle measurements which are used in okay. these uh shadow tomography right. protocols, right? So there's a trade-off though, like um how much you disturb the state and how much information you're able to extract from the state or even copies of the state. So so yeah, this is this is quite a tricky um relationship mm -hmm. to manage. Yeah. We okay. So maybe I'm asking some stupid questions. Like so we could uh do some approximate cloning, right? Like could we use this approximate clone? Okay, no. This yeah, that this the 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 um, the issue is not coming from the state. Yeah. So ignore the question just now. Uh we do have a follow-up 
question from Abdullah actually. So the paper highlights that current gradient methods fail to achieve bad propagation scaling for variational models. Could you elaborate on the limitations of existing gradient methods and what potential avenues for future research or alternative approaches uh, that might be possible to explore to address this issue? Any future work? Yes. Okay. That's a good question. So, like, I think, I think the um the way we kind of iterate uh, through all the existing um approaches for gradients is um pretty pretty much leveraging already like results that that are out there and pretty straightforward. Um, you can kind of bound um like the query complexity of those parameters used to like extract um. To estimate uh, expectation values, you can kind of like you know get a, a notion for query complexity, and then you can like sort of um, work to get the time complexity, and then show. I think that the best you can do um, there there are some known lower bounds, and the best you can do is like square root of m times the time it would take to compute the function, right? So we want we want something logarithmic in m. So this is this is, I think pretty straightforward. I think it's like in in one of the remarks of our paper. Um, but in terms of like the more interesting question, I guess is like, well, what can we do? Um, are there better methods maybe or um, something else? And what I think might be an interesting option is to um, in this setting here, maybe find a better way to store this sigma um, matrix classically, right? So like in the classical shadows, the there's still classical storage that one needs but it's efficient, right? Like they, they don't need to, to explicitly store a huge density matrix. So maybe using some sort of like, I don't know, tensor network approximations or something else, some better approximation for our state, we can still like do this whole uh, protocol and um, maybe we don't need exponential storage. Maybe we get like less precision in our gradient estimates, but maybe this is still okay, right? For stochastic gradient descent, this is probably still okay if there's some, some reasonable amount of noise in our gradient estimates. So I think this could be a cool area of study, like for a particular class of 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 um, of models. Maybe there is an efficient offline storage of them that allows us to get gradients in a nice way. So yeah, I hope that maybe answers one um, one of the uh, the ideas. But I'm sure there are tons of other things that um, that we haven't thought of as well that maybe other people are working on. And yeah. Okay, cool. I think it's like um. Um, Sana too has also have one papers on this right, like about one month after, like they propose some kind of like um, commuting log ansatz. Um, they utilize the commuting like properties of the Pauli observable, for example, and they show that they they be able to kind of estimate, um, like the gradients for this commuting commuting block simultaneously so reduce the overlap overlap of like the gradient yes. estimations are you aware of this work yes i mean okay so i don't mean to sound um you know dismissive i should probably read the work a little bit more but in some sense this is this seems quite obvious right i mean if you have um if you have observables that commute, I mean, get you can measure them simultaneously very easily, right? So if you then like make assumptions of how many blocks of commuting observables you have, you can kind of you know map out a nice relationship between how many commuting blocks you can have and how efficiently you can like measure these things, right? So it's like, I mean, in some sense, if things commute, things it, it's easy to do gradients, right? So this is, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is known, I think. Right. Okay. I see. Um and, and over here you just assume everything was just like done perfectly, right? So like what if you factor in the noise? So like um would you yes, I think, like, uh -huh. yes, I think it would still be okay. So it's, I think this uh this threshold check also works for noise quite well. There's like I think we make a statement about it, but in this paper here, you can like understand exactly what that noise can um how much noise you can have, but I think it's still quite robust. So I think that's fine. And um and yeah, and, and and this procedure I should also say is is explicit, right? Like we actually um we explicitly define what these things uh, look like in the paper. So like you can actually implement this protocol. It's not just like here is um uh, an idea of a measurement. We actually like explicitly show it. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah. I kind of like run out of specific questions, but then I would. So it seems mm -hmm. like from your work is just like oh. 
uh like optimizing like less alone like just don't care about like barren pattern at the first place and like, getting a gradient uh for each of the parameters is it's a huge bottleneck and if we didn't like um find a way to resolve this then it's basically pretty tough to to scale up like variational algorithms i would say right yeah exactly if we're gonna hope to compare these variational type approaches to neural networks we're gonna need to find a way to optimize these things more efficiently that's like the main message right and i think it's something yeah. that a lot of people ignore you know uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not too sure if like people okay, I like recently start to see more and more works. Basically, they are trying to estimate some kind of resources that require to scale things up. And then like from all the scaling, it don't really looks like to me because it's required quite a lot of resources to scale things up. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. like currently we can only like do some small scale implementations. And yeah, I just hope that someone would be able to come up with some interesting protocol that allow us to extract things like efficiently okay yeah and yeah, and, yeah i think mm -hmm. and, and this is also going to be problematic even if we have like perfect quantum computers right this is also something i mean it's not just a nisc problem it's like something that will happen um if we're using gradient descent this could be a problem yeah yeah just like we, we need a complete like just uh like what you have mentioned in your last slide we, we need to find some uh, alternative or completely new type of like machine learning out quantum machine learning algorithm that will allow us to like get around this issue. Um, yeah, okay, so mm -hmm. yeah, before we go, Abdullah actually have also have one general question. Uh, so what is the future of QML in Fort Torrent era, especially when a lot of work on like uh error corrections, uh quantum error correction is being carried out. Um so I mean, this I'm... Is, yeah, this this is anyone's guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the future of quantum machine learning in the fault tolerant era, I I would say I don't I don't know. Like I think it's very hard to say. I personally feel a bit that like quantum machine learning has been very hyped. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, and we haven't really delivered on stuff that we can do that's interesting. Um, so. I mean, maybe it's a matter of time. Once we have better com computers, we'll be able to test things empirically and some su success will come. But um, yeah, it's it's almost impossible to say at this point. I think. Right. Yeah, there are still a lot of um, like foundation works for quantum machine learning to be done in order to really put, propose a kind of um, problem that is really can utilize the kind of like uh, quantum machine learning and solve it efficiently plus a computer and this like exactly where, where we are lacking. I hope like this year QDML will be able to see more on the, the work on the foundation side because like the last year one I saw there are quite a lot of papers like is on the numerical side. So yeah. Yes, yes. I think so. I think it will be like this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's I hope see. yeah. <laughs> Let, let's see how it goes. Like just like in two two months time then we, we can see it find out. Okay, yeah, so uh, I guess we can like, kind of like close this seminar and thanks again for Chimera for like giving this like interesting talk. And then I think like this should be able to raise some awareness of people, like awareness of people on the issue of like the scaling of like the kind of like quantum gradient extraction protocol. Yep, thanks for your time and see you guys. All right, thank you.